Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're just waiting for the attendees to rise, just waiting for people to, to log in with us. Expecting this webinar today to be quite well intended, given the, um, the government's exceptionally clear guidance um, on, on what to do on Monday. So we're just going to give it 20 seconds just for people to register. Hope that you're all enjoying the summer as well, enjoying various sporting events. I'm not going to mention the football, although I was personally very sad with the result of that. But really nice to see the England team coming together and doing really well, actually, which is great. Okay, looks like the numbers are stabilizing. Just one more quick check about something that was absolutely fine. Okay, and, and we shall begin. So first of all, um, a very warm welcome um, to our Returning to the Workplace webinar. And uh, this really should be our final opening up webinar. Um, we've done a number of final opening up webinars before, but we've been caught out in the past a couple of times by some uh, U-turns by the government, as I'm sure you're all aware. And for those of you that are new to our webinars, we are, of course, Jones Chase, a firm of specialist employment lawyers. And we act for a number of companies from PLCs all the way through to startups and some fantastic individuals as well. And I'm proud to say that we have a very high success rate of looking after those that we represent, uh, which is north of 95%. And uh, we are delighted to have you with us. As ever, we have absolutely loads of content to go through. But just before we begin, I'd like to do a quick introduction to the team who are going to speak to you today. We've got one of the firm's partners, Susanna. Hello. And the other partner of the firm, Shona. Hello. And one of the firm's senior associates, who's a very regular attendee of these webinars. So thank you, Harriet. Um, hi, everybody. Okay, so just moving quickly on, in terms of the format for the webinar, we will of course run through some legal updates. And if you want to ask questions, we do these webinars to be as interactive as possible. Uh, please use the Q&A box if you want to ask questions anonymously. There's a button for you to press in the Q&A box as well. You can also use the chat function should you wish, but just please be, um, be aware that using the chat function means that you know, your name won't be anonymous. So if you want to keep it anonymous, use the Q&A box. Also, which I think is helpful, if you could select all attendees as the drop on, on the drop down bar on either the chat or the Q&A box. That means that everybody can see what you're commenting. It's, I think the default is set to all panelists. So just bear that in mind that only, only the four of us can see what you're writing. It's quite good for everyone to get involved in the conversation. So uh, please do select all attendees and panelists, I think. Also, if you want to speak live in 13 months of doing this, so or 15 months of doing these webinars, we've only had one person do this. Please let us know in the Q&A box, the chat box, that you'd like to be unmuted and um, either myself or one of the others will unmute you. I should add importantly that we are recording the webinar and this allows us to distribute the webinar to those that couldn't make it at four o'clock today. So please bear that in mind if you're asking questions on an non anonymized basis. I should emphasize that the points we're covering today are not formal legal advice and so much depends on the individual circumstances and fact of the case that to definitely do not rely on this webinar for formal legal advice. If you need a legal opinion, of course, drop us a line. We'd be delighted to help you. And as a quick reminder, the information that we're covering today is accurate as of four o'clock on the 15th of July, 2021. Things are um, always changing. So do drop us a line if you have any questions. We, we will finish at five o'clock today, if not before. We are going to leave some time for questions at the, at the end of the webinar. And we do helping people. If you find these webinars useful or our bulletins or otherwise our legal work, please feel free to recommend this to others and we'd be more than happy to, to help them as well. And uh, just lastly, we do act for individuals as well. So it's not just companies that we represent, uh, we do act on, on both sides of the fence, which helps to keep our skills nice and fresh. And uh, just moving on with, the, with today's content then quite quickly, it's easy, right? All that we do now is just go back to how things used to be on, on the 19th of July, but obviously it, it isn't that easy. And uh, I can remember on the 16th of March, 2020, which is when we, when we left the office, um, on a sort of at the time we were there five days a week and I can remember locking the door at that time thinking it's only going to be a few weeks of this lockdown much to my surprise here we are you know 15 16 months later however long it is but as of Monday it looks like things are finally opening up or are they and that's what we're going to discuss today so moving on with the first speaker we've got Susanna and she's going to provide an update and refresher on the COVID-19 vaccination debate over to you Susanna. Thank you very much. So I know that we have dealt with this topic before, but I thought it would be useful, particularly now that we will look as though we're going back into the office and employers may want to 
make some more robust decisions about whether or not they're going to ask um, their employees to come back into the office and we'll be looking at what those circumstances are that we also uh, look at whether or not employers can or should or whether it would be reasonable or not to mandate the vaccination. Let's start off by uh, just reminding ourselves about what we actually know as at the 15th of July 2021 at 1604, seven actually now. So we know that the government have announced that from October, the vaccination will be compulsory for those working in CQC registered care homes in England, unless medically exempt. Any professional visiting a care home will also need to be doubly vaccinated. So that would, for example, cover any providers going in to do hairdressing or beauticians or any other kind of service like that. And this requirement applies only to indoors. If you have workers outside, then the, the, it won't apply. It also, people exempt from that would be family, those under 18, emergency response services, and also emergency repair staff who might have to come in, for example, to fix a boiler or something. We've now got one area where we are going to see legislation introduced for mandatory vaccinations. But in addition to that, the government have confirmed that whilst there will be further consultations regarding NHS workers and domiciliary carers, there is no proposal to go any further than that. So the current position is the vaccination, other than for those working in the care sector, it, it's not mandatory. And the other thing to remind ourselves is that individuals have a right to refuse medical treatment, including vaccines. In fact, the Public Health Control of Disease Act 1984 specifically states that members of the public should not be compelled to undertake any mandatory medical treatment, including vaccinations. Let's look at what other organisations are saying. ACAS, have, ACAS has published its view that employers should support staff in getting the vaccine and the government is very much looking to employers to encourage their staff to be getting the vaccine. We know that employers have a duty to take reasonable care for safety of staff and others foreseeably affected by an employer's actions. They've also got a duty to provide a safe system of work and have obligations under section two and three of the Health and Safety of Work Act 1974. We know now that all individuals up to the age of 18 can get the vaccination and we have been told that all of those individuals should have been offered a first dose by the 19th of July. But remind ourselves that there will still be a large group of those younger individuals who will not have had a second vaccination. We know that the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation has issued advice to pregnant women and the advice now is, has changed and they are recommending that the vaccination is appropriate for pregnant women. In addition to that, we also know that there is a considerable amount of vaccine hesitancy amongst certain groups, and we may individually know some anti-vaxxers. And what that does is it all creates a nice little melting pot of what does an employer have to do and what would be reasonable or unreasonable for an employer to do dealing with that, that scenario where we know that, it's not, that it, it's not mandatory, that we can't force our employees to do it. And we've got various groups of people who potentially, if we were going to make it mandatory in any way for them uh, to uh, attend work, to have a vaccination that could pose some real difficulties for us. And in particular, those difficulties relate to potentially unfair dismissal, certainly for employees with more than two years service and certainly discrimination risk in particular in relation to disability, religion uh, and belief and age, that younger group of, of individuals that I was talking about. So in that light, I want to talk to you about what I think is a reasonable approach for an employer to be taking 
and then I will look at this concept of mandatory and, and because I know that some employers are interested in exploring having a mandatory uh, policy. But let's look at what probably is the reasonable way of approaching this at the moment. Uh, and please do ask questions and I'm sure my colleagues will jump in and have opinions too. I think it's absolutely essential and not just reasonable, but essential that you're actively talking and communicating with your staff and encouraging them to take the vaccine. And the reason I say that is because the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 obliges employers to take reasonable steps to reduce any workplace risk. And we know that the growing evidence is that the vaccine reduces transmission. So we've got a clear platform. You've certainly got a clear platform from which you can encourage your employees to be vaccinated to protect themselves and everyone in the workplace. I think you should be providing information about the positive impact of the vaccination. And as I said, the government is actually actively encouraging employers to do this. And it's released a vaccine toolkit to assist employers in running internal awareness campaigns. And I'll put that link up on the chat when I finished my section. I'm sure my other colleagues are going to suggest this, but it's probably sensible if you haven't done it already to think about surveying your staff to gauge opinion, not just about being vaccinated, but on face mask wearing and testing. But it would be useful to get a gauge for you to, and a feel of what, how your staff feel. And irrespective of mandatory vaccination and your thoughts on that, it's probably very sensible to have a vaccination policy. This is a document that you can use and would be helpful to explain what your company's stance on vaccination and its objectives are. You can provide information to them about the health and safety duties. You can also provide information to them about data protection information in relation to being asked about vaccination status, which is probably something you're going to want to ask. And there is a whole host of data protection issues around that, which I'm not going to go into, but you will need to be very clear about what you're doing around that if you're going to ask staff about vaccination. And you can set out what would be considered as unacceptable behaviour around people perhaps being harassed at work in relation to vaccination status or where they have strong views about not being vaccinated, as well as spreading untrue vaccination myths. So you can introduce some clear guidelines as to what the process and procedures would be that would follow on if that happens. So for example, disciplinary proceedings, for example. The other things you might want to think about to try and encourage your staff to get vaccinated would be to offer them paid time off for an appointment. I think most employers are probably doing that. But also perhaps to think about just paying them their normal rate of pay if they have any vaccine side effects. Most people, I think, have been fine, but I know some people have had some very bad side effects from the vaccines and you'd pay that instead of SSP. And then again, just consider whether you might agree not to include any vaccine related absence in relation to absence management. And those, again, are all things that you could set out in your vaccine policy. I think the key to this is, as ever, with everything that we've been saying uh, along the way about how people are working and how we're going to get them back into work. It's all about communication and it's all about listening to staff who have concerns. You may have staff who will say to you that they don't want to have the vaccine or they haven't been vaccinated if you've asked them. And I'm just going to remind you again, you cannot force someone to get vaccinated. And also you need to be careful about applying undue pressure on them. That could be deemed to damage the implied term of trust and confidence. And if they had two years service, could give rise to a constructive dismissal claim. So the key with this is looking at alternatives. It's about being that reasonable employer and seeing whether somebody who is very concerned about their situation, are there arrangements you can make? For example, could they continue working from home? I'm not sure how many of you would be going down the route of thinking, irrespective of the fact that we have no legislation that requires us to have the vaccination, we'd quite like to make it uh, mandatory because that way we feel that we are going to provide the uh, safest place of work for our staff and for our clients and anyone coming onto our sites. Truthfully, there isn't actually anything to prevent you from doing that, save that. 
there is a lot of work that you will need to do in preparing yourself if that is the stance you're going to do. If you were to have a mandatory policy, you could do that. And you would need to make sure that in deciding what your reasons are, what your legitimate aim is, which no doubt will be health and safety, whether you are able to objectively justify that, because you are going to need to have significant evidence to establish that mandating the vaccine is a proportionate means of achieving that aim so that you reduce any risk, certainly for indirect discrimination. That test, in my view, is going to be a, a very high one. You will need to spend some considerable time in relation to risk assessing, as well as doing impact quality assessments and various other things. So it's not something you should just do without some very serious consideration. And the reason for that is because there is real scope for uh, you to get this wrong if you don't set it out properly and you are unable to objectively justify why you're going to do this. There's been some debate about whether or not it would be appropriate or you could not make it a condition of employment for new employees that they must be vaccinated. Again, that is something that you could consider doing. But bear in mind, again, discrimination. And in theory, you could actually terminate somebody's employment who had less than two years service if they refused to have the vaccination. As long as they don't have any discrimination, potential risk, they will not have acquired unfair dismissal rights. So it is something that is possible. But I think this is an untested area and it isn't something that I would be recommending at this stage. And the reason for that is because we still have a very significant group of people who haven't been had the second vaccination yet. So you really do run a risk uh, of discrimination against that particular age group, the younger people, as well as others. I think it would be far more reasonable and sensible for an employer to wait. Let's get more medical evidence and more justification on that and perhaps review that in 2022 if you are really thinking about going down the mandatory vaccination route. Not sure if any of my colleagues have any comments. Yeah, I wonder, I totally agree with you, Susanna, about the high level of evidence needed for the proportionate aim, or the legitimate um, test that you're referring to. And I wondered what you thought about actually having expert evidence. So you had expert medical evidence or expert and or expert health and safety evidence when we get to the stage where you can have a policy that says I'm not a care home I'm not in the care industry but I'd like to have compulsory vac vaccinations because I'm not sure just doing your own risk assessment if you are an organization that has no expertise in that area I agree. I think that would be extremely sensible. I think also, though, there is a real risk. So I think there will be some sectors where it may be easier to end up being able to justify why you would have a mandatory vaccination policy. I think there will be certain areas where you're linked perhaps with the healthcare sector or the NHS or where you're interestingly plimic. Pimlico plumbers have decided this, haven't they? Certainly for new employees. And as I understand it, the argument is because they're going into people's homes and therefore th that, that is the justification for it. I don't know that is really the just. I don't know personally whether that of itself would hold up if they get sued on it. But yeah, I think there will be some sectors where this will be easier. The more evidence you get, the more important, you know, the, the better it's going to be though. The, the evidence also has to include, is there another way of protecting the worker uh, so that they aren't spreading uh, the, 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 the virus? And so that could be PPE. Vaccination isn't the only way of no, preventing. It's not. That, and so. we've got a number of other ways already currently recommended, haven't we? Which, um, yeah, that's so. right. And I think it's, it's all about just looking for the alternatives before you go for that dismissal. Yeah. And yeah. you're totally right. Yeah, and getting... in fact, all the guidance is, is that you should really avoid dismissal. Mm. <laughs> the only circumstance I think where uh, people have seemed to be fairly confident would be as if, for example, it's a condition that somebody needs to travel abroad for their job. 
and they're going to amber countries where it's a, you need to have the vaccination. But again, even in that situation, the recommendation is you should be looking to see for an alternative. So I guess that would be whether they could do a Zoom meeting or something, yeah. else, which no, in current, no. there is evidence that, that probably would work. <laughs> what do you reckon to anti-vaxxers falling under a philosophical belief in the race legislation that gives protection for individuals for religion and for philosophical belief, what, what do you think? I, th I think it's harder for them, to be perfectly honest with you. I think it's considerably harder for them. You would have to show, because for the th you have to show it's almost a way of life, don't you? So mm. vegan, that we've had the case where veganism was found to be a way of life, but I'm not sure that being an anti-vaxxer of itself would succeed. I think somebody who might be have a vaccination phobia may end up having a disability, but um, I'm not sure about anti-vaxxers. What, what about, so anti-vaxxers is, is a category, but what about a, a broader idea of, of no medical intervention, either with Jehovah's Witnesses yeah. as a, a, a no medical I think it again, could be outside so, of the remit of Jehovah's Yeah, Witnesses. so I think again, in that situation, I think you they would be covered. Yeah, uh, and I, so the guidelines, the guidance is that if you're going to look at that, uh, look at having a mandatory vaccine policy, you would certainly need to perhaps exclude not only the medically exempt, but also people with a re religion and belief. Yeah. That's yeah. totally correct. I'm sorry, guys, and we could discuss this for <laughs> hours, but uh, time is cracking on. We've got 34 minutes to cover the rest of the content. We have had a question in, from F. Griffiths in relation to your section, and the question is, could you advise us on where, on, on where we stand with asking employees that have travelled abroad for proof of double vaccination so they don't need to quarantine and should we file a vaccination certificate on their file? Would you need some time with that, Susanna, or, um, or do you have the answer? For well, that? shall we? Yeah, I'll answer that at the end. Okay. Yeah. And we've had two other questions in, one from Paul in the chat box, which, um, Paul, I will cover that in my section. And there's another one from Cara. And I don't know, Shona, maybe this fits within yeah. your section. So whilst yeah. Harriet's speaking, you can have a quick look at that, if that's okay. Moving very quickly on to, this is 20 past, 20, 25 past four, where is time going? Harriet's going to speak to you all about some decisions from the employment tribunals about COVID and what has been tested already. So Harriet, over to you. Thanks, Dean. Um, yeah, just a slight uh, shift in in topic, and we'll come back to all the practical advice going forwards with uh, with Shona and Dean. But just in terms of what's sort of happened backwards looking and how this has impacted um, in terms of tribunal cases, there's been three more decisions in the employment tribunals since I covered the case um, back in May. There was a, a decision we, we looked at before, and these three cases are all again first instance decisions, so not binding on other tribunals. But it gives you an idea idea of how tribunals are dealing with the issues that arise and they're all they're all quite different. The first case is Montanaro and Landsafe. Here it was decided that the, an employee who remained in Italy at the outbreak of the pandemic was automatically unfairly dismissed. And just as a reminder on this bit of the legislation, an employee is automatically unfairly dismissed if the reason or if more than one the principal reason for their dismissal is that in circumstances of danger which the employee reasonably believed to be serious and imminent, they took or proposed to take appropriate steps to protect themselves or others from the danger. And that's uh, section 101E of the Employment Rights Act. And just looking at the facts, I think it's quite interesting to see a bit of the detail as to how um, these scenarios arise. I'll call Mr M, who was employed by Landsafe, L from February 2020, um, provided services to L's client um, B, and L is a computer specialist company which provides staff and services to other companies. So the reason that M was in Italy was because he believed he had permission to take holiday on the 9th and 10th of March for his sister's wedding. And then part of the case was that it was later denied by the employer that he did have the permission. But whilst M was in Italy on the 9th of March, Italy went into lockdown and the government guidance then stipulated 14 days isolation on return from Italy and M was due to fly home the next day. So obviously not really knowing what to do, he texted his manager early on the 10th of March, sending a link to the government guidance on returning travellers and saying he'd be in contact. And in this case, as the tribunal would in any case, they will look at the public health situation as known to the claimant at the time. And here, the individual wasn't sure if it was safe to travel, didn't want to go against the government guidance and didn't want to put anyone at risk. And the employer's response was, you know, keep your mobile and laptop on, uh, wait for instructions. And M understood this as 
wait for a response and don't travel home. So he carried on working. He didn't have any response from his employer. And then very strangely, uh, the employer sent a letter to his home address in London on the 11th of March saying he'd been dismissed. And their reason was supposed to be failing to follow company procedures and taking unauthorised leave. But the letter was, was very strange, lots of errors and not really very credible. And then M's position not having received that letter was the guidelines have changed around self-isolation. I'm happy to come back to work. I can travel back. What should I do? got nothing apart from his P45 on the 1st of April. I suppose this case is quite stark in that the employer so obviously behaved unreasonably, but it's interesting to look at the tribunal's thought process here. So his claim was successful, automatic unfair dismissal under section 101E. He didn't have a successful claim under the other relevant section, uh, which is uh, subsection D, because it wasn't a situation where he wasn't prepared to return or proposed not to return to his place of work. And obviously there might be lots of situations where someone's saying, I'm not coming in because I'm, I'm concerned. But this was a case where uh, they were communicating um, that they were going to take certain steps to protect themselves. And the requirements of this section are to take appropriate steps to protect themselves or other persons from danger. They communicate to their employer that they plan to take those steps and or they communicate the circumstances of danger by an appropriate means. Um, and it's all about what the employee reasonably believed at the time they acted. And importantly, the, the circumstances of danger has a wide meaning. It doesn't need to relate to the workplace itself in these circumstances. And here the tribunal held that there were circumstances of danger given a pandemic had just been declared and the obvious risk of ca con catching uh, a contagious virus could lead to serious illness and death. And it was reasonable that he believed the danger was serious and imminent, even though in this case he hadn't said much about the concerns he had about the danger. The tribunal thought he'd said enough to demonstrate that he considered that the general condition of the COVID-19 virus was a serious and imminent danger. So it looks like it's not going to be that difficult, depending on the time at which the, the employee's case relates to, to say that actually the fact that we have the virus um, means there is a serious and imminent danger and it's just about the workplace. And here, importantly, he had taken appropriate steps to protect himself and others He'd asked the employee for advice and assistance when you know, the, the employer had wanted him to fly to London. He'd forwarded appropriate information about the situation in Italy. He was ready to work, etc. And he did all the right things. The dismissal letter wasn't really relevant to his circumstances. It just wasn't credible. So the tribunal concluded here that the M had been dismissed because he had communicated the difficulties posed by the pandemic and proposed to work remotely from Italy until the circumstances changed. And it wasn't about the fact that he'd taken unauthorised leave. So that's quite um, an interesting decision. And then the next case is group, and that one's from May. And here the case was unsuccessful. And again, it's interesting to look at why. And the employee in this case said they felt uncomfortable commuting and attending the office during lockdown. Um, and they asked to be furloughed. And this case, when he was dismissed, it wasn't automatically unfair dismissal under the same section we've just looked at. So the company that Mr A worked for sells and distributes PPE. And unsurprisingly, at the out March, April last year and thereafter, they have been very busy due to the demand for PPE um, from many um, sources. And in March and April last year, A repeatedly asked work from home or be placed on furlough, um, explaining that he was uncomfortable using public transport and working in the office, which is something that, that um, many employees may still be facing now. And they told him that his job could not be done from home. Furlough was not possible because the business was so busy and gave him the option of taking a holiday or on leave. A was not having any of it. He just said that's not an option. I was three more times to be furloughed. And then after the final request, he was dismissed by email on the same day. And in this case, as in probably quite a lot of cases which were brought under this section, he didn't have sufficient service to claim ordinary unfair dismissal. And that potentially is why he was alleging the automatic unfair dismissal under section 100 for having taken steps to protect himself from danger, he said. And just to be aware, if an employee doesn't have that qualifying service to bring an ordinary unfair dismissal claim, the burden of proof is on the employee to show an automatically unfair reason for dismissal, for which no qualifying service is required. And the tribunal found here that the, the, the COVID situation in March and April last year did pose a serious and imminent threat to public health. 
A had expressed concern about commuting and attending the office. So he got over the hurdle of showing he really believed that there were circumstances of serious and imminent danger. So again, that wasn't difficult to show in these in these cases. And these were both at the obviously the outset of the pandemic. The problem for Mr. A here was that he needed to show he took appropriate steps to protect himself from danger or have communicated the circumstances of danger to the company. And here, the employer had reasonably concluded that his job could not be done from home. He didn't qualify for furlough, but as I said, had suggested taking holiday or unpaid leave. And the company had also importantly sent many communications to staff about the precautions they were taking in the workplace to try and make it COVID secure. And also they said they were following the government guidance. A's response was only that he just wanted to stay at home and be paid, basically. And these demands were not appropriate steps to protect himself from danger and his claim failed. And the tribunal actually found the reason for his dismissal was that the employer didn't want him to two years service so that he would be able to bring an unfair dismissal claim because he was perceived to be a difficult and challenging employee who had written impertinent emails demanding to be furloughed or allowed to work from home. And these were the principal reasons for the claimant's dismissal not because of the concerns he'd raised about coming into work or using public transport. So we can see that in this case, it's important that the employer has got evidence of what their reason for dismissal is, even if it may not be a great reason if somebody did have two years service, but here obviously he didn't. So that was the employer's defence. And also in this case, you can see that the pandemic may on, not on its own justify a refusal to attend work if the employers have reasonably tried to accommodate an employer concerns and to reduce um, the, the risk of transmission and communicated this to staff. The last case I'm going to look at is concerning pregnancy discrimination. It's called Prosser and Community Gateway Association and this is based from last month and I think this is the first published judgment that addresses the issue of pregnancy discrimination in the context of the pandemic and here the tribunal had to decide if a pregnant woman who was engaged under a zero hours contract was discriminated against after she was sent home for health and safety reasons and wasn't allowed to return for several months. Just looking at the facts, so before the pandemic she worked on average four shifts a month. She told her employer she was pregnant in March 2020. The employer sent her a link to the government's guidance which classified pregnant workers as clinically vulnerable. When she arrived for a shift, she was sent home to protect her from contracting the virus at work, but the employer perhaps didn't have great communication as to why she'd been suspended from work, how long it was going to last or what she would be paid. So they perhaps did the right thing sending her home, but didn't get their communication, which is, is always so important. So in May, she said she, she wanted to come back. Uh, the employer did conduct a risk assessment to see if it was safe for her to do. And they determined that she need, they needed to put perspex screens up between the desks before she could come back because the desks were, were a bit too close together. And when she was then offered shifts towards the end of May, so she was originally offered shift towards the end of May, but that didn't work out because it took longer to put the perspex screens in place. And she ended up raising a grievance saying, I've suffered pregnancy discrimination because I haven't been paid the shifts I should have worked and you haven't let me return to work. The employer then did invite her to return to work, conducted another risk assessment um, because it still hadn't got these Perspex screens uh, installed, but by that time they'd moved the desks further apart and considered it was safe to return to work. So they acknowledged that they had made a mistake in not paying her and they did subsequently pay her for the shifts she would have worked April, May, June and July. She came back to work and her grievance was dismissed, but she still brought a claim arguing that sending her home and not allowing her return to work and delaying payment amounted to direct pregnancy and maternity discrimination. And she lost her claim and really because the reason she'd been sent home was because she was classed as vulnerable. That wasn't unfavourable treatment. It was doing the right thing in following the public health advice. Um, not allowing her to return until appropriate COVID secure measures have been put in place again wasn't unfavourable treatment. Again, they were just trying to comply with the legislation which was there to protect her and not paying her for the shift she should have worked on the face of it was unfavourable treatment, but the tribunal said it wasn't related to her pregnancy, it was just a mistake. So just some practical tips and then I shall finish. I think this judgment's reassuring for employers who are having to, to deal with how to help pregnant workers and if you send them home, then that's likely to be justified, depending on obviously the, the public health advice, etc. But obviously you do need to do a specific risk assessment. And if there are risks, try and remove them so far as you can. Um, 
this, I think the guidance is still is that pregnant women should continue to work if they can do, if it's safe. But I understand that the risks are greater for those over 28 weeks pregnant. And if you can't avoid the risks, alter the employee's working conditions or hours temporarily. If you can't do that, offer suitable alternative work. Um, and if you can't, then you must suspend them, but you have to pay them uh, full pay. Uh, and the fact that she was casual staff didn't make any difference. The protections still um, apply equally. So uh, I shall stop now and allow others to speak, but that's a, just a bit of an update on uh, where we are with, with employment tribunal decisions in this area. Thanks. That's, that's great. Thanks so much, uh, Harriet. That's fantastic. Okay, so when it's moving on to your section, we've got 20 minutes left. I'm happy to cut my, I'll, I'll whiz through my section super quickly. There's no need for you to rush it. We've got five questions to deal with as well. There's another one from Paul about vaccination in the chat box, so if we can pick it up as well. And over to you, Shona, and you're going to speak about the government's new guidance, for want of a better expression, for what happens on the 19th of July. Yeah, I thought I'd cover the topic of how to deal with the range of interpretations of this personal responsibility, because the government has clearly said we're now taking away the rule that says where you can work from home, you should and we are suggesting that you can go back to the office. And it's a matter of personal responsibility then how you behave. And it's dealing with an entire employee population with this notion of personal responsibility. And there are three main areas of concern in the workplace as to what will uh, keep uh, the employees safe. Bearing in mind we've heard from Susanna about the a duty to have a safe system of work and a safe place of work and we've heard from Harriet of the fact-based cases where individuals have alleged that uh, they are at risk from a health and safety concern that either pregnancy or uh, the individual that was the PPE company. So there are a range of interpretations as to what is safe and someone's personal responsibility with that. And we've got uh, three areas, face coverings, social distancing, and the length of time that you're in a particular room with people, so the period of time that you're working with others. Whereas before we had this legal compulsion to work at home and we could rely upon that, now we don't have that legal compulsion. And so as an employer, our standards as to what is a safe place of work have shifted. Uh, we have to think again as to what is that safe place of work as people are moving from home to the office. So there's the getting to work time in the safe place, and then there's at work. And then when you're at work, there will be meeting times, how long you're going to have face-to-face -face meeting times arranged for. And there's also then a uh, time when you're working on your own, but you may be working in a room with others and, and not uh, in a room of your own. And then we've got different types of workers. We have workers generally, which may include those that are pregnant, uh, those that are not pregnant and workers generally that are attending the workplace. And then we've got higher risk employees. These are not employees that are clinically extremely vulnerable. These are just higher risk employees, male employees, ethnic minority employees, someone with a high BMI and someone with any other underlying health condition that is not extremely, uh, clinically extremely vulnerable. So you're mixing together the getting to work, the being at work, what's done at work, a different range of employees, and then this face covering, social distancing, and the uh, notion of how long you're going to be in one place with a whole load of other people in a room, and personal responsibility. And as HR, from the beginning of this pandemic, your role has been, in my view, the most important role within the organisation as you're having to balance the views uh, of uh, each individual employee with the government's ever-changing guidelines and having to keep a business going because it's the employees who keep that business on its feet. You may have the extreme views, uh, people that, uh, I say extreme, they're lied with the views in which they're making, and you may have those that are not lied but do have views on the subject and you don't know them just because they're not making a lot of noise about it. But as HRs, you'll, you'll have to balance this. And in my view, there will be a lot of noise because we're being told by the health secretary himself that there'll be possibly 50,000 to 100,000 cases by mid-August. And our notion of that level of cases is that is unsafe. We are not meant to be out in the public with that level of cases. Uh, Susanna's covered the vaccination element to this, but it still feels as if it is uh, a time when 
COVID could be caught, that could be leading to long COVID, and or self-isolation, which you can't afford or you can afford, but actually you don't want to be away from the workplace, or that's uh, not something that could be organised because you've got a job that has to be done in the workplace. So as HR, if you do nothing now to alleviate that conflict of competing rights, you could have grievances, you could have individuals complaining about constructive dismissal, you could have discrimination claims. Equally, if you do something now, you could have grievances, constructive dismissal and or discrimination cases uh, as a result of what you have done. So it's getting that balance right and how to get that balance right uh, that we're, I'm going to talk about. I just want to illustrate this competing rights thing because the only time we've really seen this before is in discrimination cases. And there's a case talking about the balancing and competing rights of religion as opposed to homosexuality and sexual orientation. It was a, a female employee who qualified to administer marriages and she worked for a local authority, Mrs Liddell, and she was an extremely religious individual and she did not want to conduct uh, marriage uh, ceremonies for homosexual couples and she refused to do that as part of her duties. That she was dismissed for refusing to do that. And so the tribunal and the courts through the system that went all the way to the European court had to decide whose side do we fall on for these competing rights? Do we give the rights of the, that individual who's protected because of their religion or the rights of the individuals because of their sexuality? And in the end, the European court and the, the Court of Appeal in the UK agreed uh, that the, the rights that were protected in that case were the rights of the individuals wanting to get married in a same-sex couple. So the sexual orientation protected characteristic trumped the religious protected characteristic of Mrs Liddell, and therefore her dismissal was not discriminatory uh, nor unfair. In this instance, you're competing with those that feel highly vulnerable. They may not be clinically vulnerable uh, individuals as defined by the government or as under the COVID-19 risk assessment, but they may feel that they don't want to travel into work. Uh, they don't want to be at work in a room with an individual that talks about their social life. They happen to be between the age of 20 and 25 and they're talking about the great time they're having socially. They know they know they're not second vaccinated at this stage as a at that age of individual and um, whose rights are you protecting and how will you protect the organization for from claims in relation to those two individuals where there is no legal compulsion as i said at the beginning because the government has now said this is a matter of personal responsibility and yet as an organization you owe a duty to provide a safe system of work and a safe place of work well, the answer is, it's on a case by case basis. So uh, just as with the individual with the religious rights and the individual with sexual orientation rights, those that uh, say that they don't want to work in the workplace where someone is knowingly got a social life that doesn't uh, make them feel safe at work despite being double vaccinated, and they may be, listen to their concerns. It could be that moving them to another office space would work. It could be having different shift systems for the two individuals. It could be for that individual that they can take their work and remain at home until at such time as everyone is double vaccinated or the case load, the case numbers as predicted for August have reduced significantly and therefore the reduction in risk has significantly reduced. But from HR's perspective, the most important thing is to find out the, the problem behind the concern that the individual has, because often that can be resolved by a, a change of place of work, as I've mentioned, or it can be rather than moving the individual who feels highly vulnerable, moving the individual who's got the great social life and can work at, in another area with others who don't have similar concerns to those that do. So from HR's perspective, it's trying to understand the fact sensitive nature of each concern that the individual has. And you won't know unless you ask, uh, because 
on, unless the individual's making a lot of noise themselves, this will have to be something that you raise and uh, want to understand what is the concern. Because often when uh, matters are referred to us uh, for advice, um, it's someone that's refusing to come into work, but it's interesting then to know the facts behind that concern and how that's been dealt with in the past and how that could be dealt with for this set of circumstances. And in fact, we've got a very good question that's come in from someone called Cara Morrison Johnson, uh, John, thank you, Cara. It says, our company is allowing those who are classed as clinically extremely vulnerable to continue working at home for this foreseeable future. We will use the guidance provided by the government and what constitutes clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, there's guidance from the government. There's also uh, a COVID-19 risk assessment that can be done that's provided on the government website. Cara asks, I'd like to know where we stand legally. If an employee has requested to stay at home as they view someone in their immediate household as vulnerable, but they do not fit the government criteria because they have diabetes. Can we insist they return to the office and where do we stand if something happens to the person in their household as a result of the employee returning to the office? Yes, in this instance, the personal circumstances for this employee are home circumstances. It's not someone in the office that they're concerned about significantly or not any one identifiable employee, but their home circumstances is living with a a person with diabetes, they're not clinically extremely vulnerable as defined by the government, but the individual is concerned. You can ask them to return to the office and provide them with reassurance that the office is COVID-19 secure. You've taken into account all the guidance from the health and safety executive guidelines to show that it is a safe place. You could suggest to that individual if they wanted to carry on wearing face covering within the office place, they're, they're very much uh, welcome to do so. There's no right or wrong in doing that. You could also suggest to them that they can continue to socially distance. And if there's a, an area that you can allow them to work, then uh, that provides them with the adequate protection because they're carrying on with guidelines that are no longer legally ne necessary according to the government and they're relying upon scientific evidence. But you're allowing that to carry on post July 19 in order for them to come into the office and it is a secure place of work. So my view would be, yes, sit down with the employee. Uh, there's no extreme health and safety issue for them that creates a danger at work. It's they are safe at work because of the necessary steps that you've taken. The little kick in the tail that you've asked is, as a result, what happens to the poor employee in their household if something happens to them as a result of the employee returning to the office? That's a big phrase, as a result of. It's not that may not be the reason why something happens to the individual that is at home. So there's, there has to be, we're not personal injury lawyers, but there has to be a connection between what happens to the person at home, say they become extremely ill, uh, at a period of time that happens to coincide with the individual that they share a house with returning to the office. But that doesn't mean it's not as a result of. That's a very high level of connection there that you're attributing to the office space and you will be able to show that you've got a safe place of work. There's no reason that link is made to then the illness of the individual at home. So that's what I'd answer uh, to that particular question. Five top thoughts to think about. As the HR business partner, HR manager or HR director, you could decide we're going to further delay coming back to work. We're not going to have any of this extra conflict. We're going to delay that. And actually the travel is too insecure. I, I know TFL London, Transport for London has said face coverings must still be worn as a condition of carriage. So you'd be fined if you didn't post Monday, but people are still vulnerable in relation to the thought of traveling in. So you may decide we're going to delay that return to work date or do it in phases for those that don't mind, but don't prejudice those that do mind. You may decide to furlough clinically vulnerable employees that's available up to 30 September, and that's a, another thought. Uh, please reassure employees of what steps you're taking, both health and safety wise, and particularly with ventilation and for periods of time for meetings and room size, what you're doing about social distancing, even though it's not necessary. And then having reassured the employees what their thoughts are and why. You may think of introducing a rotor system, having determined those that are very concerned, those that are not, and, and not mixing the two because uh, you're just creating conflict where it doesn't need to be created. And for those already at work, um, 
we've got this new travel risk because of the increased number of cases, you may decide that you will provide face coverings for those employees and or the lateral flow test that's still free uh, under the government scheme. There, there isn't a date yet that's been put in place when that will be removed, but lateral flow testing is still free under the government uh, scheme. So your aim is to keep people in work, wherever that may be, in the office place or at home, that's your aim, in work without conflict, alleviate their concerns, and that in turn then reduces the grievances, the claims, both constructive dismissal and uh, discrimination. Dean. Thanks, Sharon, thanks so much. And um, very quickly running out of time, aren't we? But um, I'll cover my section really quickly. Just going back to Cara's scenario, just something to throw in as well. It depends on the very particular fact of the case, but people have, uh, employees have to be aware of associative disability discrimination claims as well depending on if the person they're caring for may have a disability. Everything that you said, Shona, completely goes in favour of the employer's justification to get them to return to the office. But it's just something that employees need to think about as well, is that people may try to bring these types of claims as well, or whistleblowing. So it is all about the justification and, and the steps that you take. But moving very quickly on, I'm just going to speak to you all for a few minutes. Uh, we may run a, a little bit over and we will deal with the questions as well. But I want to speak to you all about testing. So I've got way too many windows open here, just bear with me and whether you can lawfully require your staff to undergo testing in the workplace. And sorry, just bear with me. I just can't seem to make this into a full PowerPoint at the moment, just because the Zoom thing is hanging over where it should be. Okay, well maybe we'll, we'll just move on uh, as we are. In terms of the basic principles for whether an employer can lawfully require your staff to take a COVID test, first of all, it is not, it's not a legal requirement. So there's no mandate from the government. And that says that you have to do this. So employers can introduce testing on a voluntary basis, which is widely encouraged by the government. And of course, and there are these testing kits available, which is the lateral flow testing, not the other testing is a PCR test. And employers have three options in this regard. So I think the most popular one is for employers to do DIY, do your own testing. So you basically set that up within the workplace and get these free kits from the government, which um, you can uh, subscribe and to receive. The second option of doing it in practice is to get a third party provider uh, to come in and to test the workforce. And the third option is, is, is to use the community testing through local authority testing sites. So it really is up to the employee which one that they want to do. Again, moving quickly on, in terms of the legal issues of whether or not you can, or whether or not you require your staff to take a COVID test before returning to the workplace. Importantly, or very importantly, an employer cannot compel an employee to take a COVID test without their consent okay so and um, that's absolutely fundamental employees may of course regard testing as uncomfortable and an unnecessary invasion of their privacy of course there are um, a wealth of data protection issues that as well but the ico has issued specific guidance on covid testing that is available on the ico's website and the data that's gathered from testing is is specified as special category personal data which does um, carry quite a high level of obligation on the part of the employer. Also, uh, we, as we already covered, there could be potential discrimination claims if you re require your staff to take a COVID test and also some um, potentially constructive dismissal cases as well. So there are some legal risks involved in uh, asking staff to take the test. In terms of some practical guidance, just getting read, if, so if, if you are like sort of pimlico plumbers uh, in, in relation to the vaccination, if you are going to roll out um, a policy of having of making all of your staff a requirement to undergo COVID testing, um, first of all, it, I think it's incredibly important for you to be flexible and uh, to look for alternative options. For example, can can some employees work from home? If they can't work from home, is there a different job that they can do whilst working from home? And this is all recommended by the ACAS guidance on the subject. And you will need to definitely build justification if you're going to require COVID testing to take place. So for example, is your workplace when we're social distancing is incredibly difficult, but where we work, we can achieve social distancing with the road system, for example, which is what we're doing. Importantly, and I think this is critical carrier to health and safety risk assessment, and it is worth getting external um, expert advice on this, as you've already covered. You will also keep, need to keep the company's position under constant review because the, the public position of this is changing frequently. And I would also agree that you record your decisions every single step of the way, because if there are going to be some legal claims brought in relation to this, then you're going to have to justify your decisions. The ACAS guidance itself, and we would obviously agree with this, uh, recommends that employees take legal advice before rolling out 
a COVID testing policy. And something that we think is a good idea is to create a testing policy. We can help uh, prepare a, a draft of that if need be. And just to roll that out to the workforce, just to get feedback on it before you actually go live with it as well. So practical guidance, part two and three. And this is all in the ACAS guidance on workplace testing. They say to consult with your staff before rolling testing out, tell them how testing would work, how will the results be provided, what would be the process to follow if someone does actually test positive for COVID-19, and what also cover what pay staff will receive if they have to self-isolate. Of course, the rules in this regard are changing in August, I think the 16th. And what incentive you could, you could offer to your staff as well is that if they, are, if they do test positive and they are required to self-isolate and then take a PCR test, Maybe you would say to encourage consent for testing, you can say that you won't be switched to SSP, you will pay companies sick pay for the isolation period. Also, you need to think about how absence for self-isolation will be counted, if a worker cannot work from home, and sometimes it will trigger an absence warning or a disciplinary process. So maybe what you do is any COVID-related absence from work, uh, which does not count towards your absence record um, for the purposes of the disciplinary process. Okay, and also you need to consult with the staff about how the employer will look after the data that's created from workplace testing. And just finally, I thought I'd just cover this briefly as well. What would you do when, if an employee says, no, I'm not going to take the test? Here, as ever, dialogue is absolutely critical. You will need to consider all of the options. If you, if you are the type of employer where you believe from a health and safety perspective, it's absolutely critical that all staff take COVID tests to protect others within the workplace then you need to consider are there any old, other alternatives, can the person work from home, etc. all of these different considerations and there are many. And again, getting a health and safety risk assessment, keeping it up to date, because your counter argument is that, well, as an employer, we have a duty of care to protect the well-being of our staff. If you've got a really good, knowledgeable health and safety expert backing you, then that puts you in a much better position. Can you argue it's a reasonable management instruction for staff to take the test? And again, this all depends on the circumstances. Depending, in some cases it may be, but again, you just have to really back this up with justification. Something that would help you as well is if you deem it appropriate to make it a contractual requirement that staff um, agree to uh, taking the test, then ultimately if somebody does agree, then that refusal could be if you have the contractual requirement in place via a valid contractual variation exercise. Again, we can help with this if needed. The, the refusal to take the test in the circumstances could be a breach of contract on the part of the employee, which is actionable, or failing which, if you don't have the contractual requirement, it may, in the circumstances, be an implied contractual term, or otherwise it could be deemed to be a failure to follow a reasonable management instruction. And then that will allow you to, albeit it, this is incredibly risky and we would recommend you take legal advice before doing this, you would be able to take disciplinary action in the right circumstances and even dismiss in extreme cases if people don't refuse to undergo the test. So in short, you could never legally compel someone to take the test. However, legally, again, there may be some things that you can do around the disciplinary process um, if they refuse to do. But again, lastly, to end on this point, you must have sufficient justification in place, okay? If anybody wants a copy of these slides, I can email them out. It's uh, dean, D-E-A-N dot Jones, J-O-N-E-S at joneschase.com. Okay, and, and just finally, I think we're, we're running over slightly, but we have got a few questions left to answer, haven't we? The first one is from F. Griffiths and asking, could we advise, and I'd have to emphasize that the views we're giving you today are not formal legal advice today, so much depends on the facts of each case, but can we give us a maybe on where an employer stands with asking employees that have traveled uh, abroad for proof of double vaccination, so they don't need a quarantine and should and imply file a vaccination certificate. Does anybody within the team have it have any views on this? No? Okay. You're on, on mute, Shona. Sorry. You're off mute now, I think. Yeah. I, I, I did. I thought possibly earlier Susanna mentioned about looking, but I'm very happy to give a view uh, on this. Um, if the individual has been abroad, uh, just having come back with a double vaccinated certificate, my hot sticky hand from abroad, uh, you get checked so many times that they couldn't have possibly got anywhere abroad without having shown that certificate to a number of government authority members. Uh, I, if they have been abroad, then you can be sure that they do have that double vaccination certificate in place because they've been asked for it so many times. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so we are very short on time. Susanna, I'm not sure if, if you answered this question in, in writing earlier, but we've had one from Karen, who's basically saying that she missed some of the mandatory vaccination chat, but her company have implemented a mandatory vaccine, uh, to, uh, sorry, mandatory vaccine to be in the office, but can still work from home if they're not. The majority of our people have voted for mandatory, and would that be okay if we're not dismissing people because of it? Obviously, there's no risk of unfair dismissal if they're not going to, if you're not um, uh, going to dismiss anybody. But you, you do just need to still watch out for the discrimination angle here, and also just and uh, and also potentially constructive dismissal because if you're isolating people because they're not having a vaccination from not permitting them into the office or they're being excluded or in any way treated less favourably by virtue of that fact, then I'm afraid that there really is some risk there for you. So my advice would be to be speaking to any individual who doesn't want to be vaccinated and assessing the reasons why they have that view, just in order to really assess what your risks are on this. I agree, because actually this is not just also the immediate uh, period of time where you're saying to people now about staying at home, but say someone misses out on promotion, misses out on yeah. some training, et cetera. This is long-term ripple effect here that yeah. an individual could think, hold on a minute, this all goes back to when I said. I've and I think you are imposing a condition, aren't you, which says that you yeah. cannot come into our office. And yeah. so people have problems with it. And I think you need to look at more specifically about the reasons uh, behind it, their reason behind not wanting to, go, to have the vaccination. Okay, fantastic. And just very, because we are running over, there was a question from Paul earlier in the chat and Paul is asking, can an employer require employees to take COVID tests, especially if company required medicals and relevant tests, for example, hand down vibration tests. I mean, um, super quickly, as I mentioned earlier, you compel them to take a test, but depending on your general testing, policy, then there could be consequences if they don't. If you need any further help on that, you know, let me know. Uh, we, we, you can make it contractual in, in the right way as well. And just finally, another question in from Paul, I think. So is it reasonable to ask employees to inform their employee which country they're traveling to on their up, upcoming vacation? So any views on that one? You can always ask, of course. And I think this fits you know, very firmly into what is the company's general policy on vaccinations anyway. If you have no vaccination policy and all of a sudden you're asking employees these questions, you're in a little bit more of a sticky situation. If, however, you have a super robust vaccination policy, and this is part of it, I think you're in a much better position, plus if, if the health and safety... Uh, yeah. But this demonstrates why you need a vaccination policy so people mm. understand what it is you they may be asked and why you may be asking it. I think it makes your, it'll make the company's life easier to manage yeah. a situation like that. I think without such a policy, you could say to an individual, are you going to red, amber or green? That you're not asking anything personal there. It's whether they're on a red list or an amber list or a green list. If on mm. a red list, then have they got holiday to cover that period of time they've got to be in a hotel at Heathrow when they come back? And if they do, then obviously, then they are complying with everything within the company organisation if they're able to take that holiday for that period of time. I think red, amber and green is absolutely fine to ask. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think it's, it's just more, more justification for having a really good policy about this because we can say if you don't have enough holiday to, to cover any period of isolation when you get back and you can't work from home, there could be consequences for that as well. Okay, we've run uh, nine minutes over, so we're normally very efficient in finishing at five o'clock. I'm sorry, but we have covered everything. Quick reminder that the information we've covered today is accurate as of the 15th of July. A roll on Monday, this is going to be very interesting. And if anybody has any questions, I'm, or it, I'm sure that you all have our email addresses. Or you can reach me, dean.jones at joanchase.com or julie.field at joanchase.com as well. Um, thanks so much for um, attending today. And if anybody wants to copy the slides, let me know as well. But otherwise, yeah, thank you very much. And we will see you at the end of August, which is our next webinar. Okay, thanks and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.